Hi everyone. Uh, in this lecture, we'll start with a discussion of frequency response of single stage amplifiers. Shown here uh, is an amplifier with a fixed gain. So as we have discussed in the previous lectures, the gain of an amplifier is independent of frequency. So whether you apply a sinusoid of a low frequency or a high frequency sinusoid, the gain will always be the same. But in practice, however, either because of parasitics, parasitic capacitors, or because of the capacitance of the load itself, the gain is normally a very strong function of frequency of the input of the input signal. Sometimes we engineer circuits or systems to behave as amplifiers only in a certain range of frequencies. So shown here is an example of what we would call an RF circuit, radio frequency tuned circuit, which has to give gain only in a narrow range of frequencies centered around the carrier frequency F0. Now shown here is a typical low frequency audio amplifier frequency characteristic which has to amplify in a low frequency in a range of frequencies in the lower frequency range and reject the frequencies which are away from the range of amplification. So that's why understanding and knowing how to estimate the frequency response is very important. The second thing is how do you find the stability of a system? The systems sometimes if for a stable system if I feed an input with a finite energy if the gain of the system is finite, then the output should also be finite. Okay, But if this output is growing unbounded, then the system is unstable. So these two information, so we need to know if a system is stable and if it is stable, what is the frequency response of the system. So these are the two important things for uh, amplifier circuits. Now if you have taken any basic course on Laplace transforms, you would know that but the reason why we go to Laplace transforms is that if I have a system H of t with a characterized by an impulse response H of t, again an impulse response is measured by feeding an impulse to an input, impulse to a system and measuring the output and the output will be an impulse is what we call an impulse response if you feed impulse as an input to the system. Now shown here is what we call the convolution integral. If you know the impulse response you can predict the output of a system output of the system for any input. Now this is again valid for what we call as an LTA system, linear and time invariant systems. Okay, So then we can use the convolution integral to predict the output for any input. So this is the convolution integral. You take the impulse response, multiply it by uh, delayed and reflected versions of the input Okay, for different values of t. Then you will get the y for those values of t. Okay, so that's how you get the complete uh, complete output as a function of time. Now, one of the main reasons why we go for Laplace transforms is that uh, now one way is that what I've shown here is the time domain representation. So y of t being x of t convolved with h of t, it's entirely a time domain operation. Now, when we go to Laplacian domain. So by using the Laplacian integral, which is, uh, I think most of you know that, just to quickly refresh it. So refresh your memory. So if h of t is a time domain signal, then applying this integral, you will get the Laplace transform. S here is a complex number. Okay. So once you know the Laplace transform, you can very easily predict the output by simply multiplying the Laplace transform of the output by simply multiplying the input's Laplace transform and the Laplace transform of the impulse response. This H of S, the Laplace transform of the impulse response is what we call as transfer function. And it's very important, you can predict the stability of a system and the frequency response just with the knowledge of the transfer function. Now since S is a complex number, uh, we borrow, we we'll normally borrow certain terms from the complex analysis. So one of the terms is poles. So where the values of s at which the transfer function h of s blows up to infinity is what we call as a pole and where it goes to zero, it diminishes to zero is what we refer to as a zero. Okay. Now there are two things as I discussed which are important. One is stability, the other one is frequency response. Now once you have the transfer function in hand, uh, once you have the transfer function, so by looking at the location of the poles on an s plane we can very clearly say whether the system is stable or not. And then S here as I said is a complex number. It has both a real part and an imaginary part. 
and if I evaluate it along along the sigma equal to zero line or s equal to j omega axis, okay. If I find the value of h of s, I find it at s equal to j omega, I get what we call as the frequency response. This tells you the behavior of the amplifier for different frequencies. Okay, so which is why h of s, it gives you a complete information that you need to know about the system. It tells you both about the stability and also it gives you information about the frequency response of the system. Now shown here is what we call as the s plane. Um, which, which on the S-plane, when you look at the location of the poles, you can say if the system is stable or not. So this side of it, this, this part of the S-plane is what we call as a right of S-plane. And this part of it is what we call the le left of S-plane. And this is the S equal to Z, uh, J omega or the J omega axis, S equal to uh, J omega line or the J omega axis. Now, poles that are occurring on the real line. So these are called the real poles. So this is a right of plane real pole, a left of plane real pole, and this is the this is a real. Actually, we can we will, as we will later see, this pole is at omega equal to zero itself. It's a real pole, but occurs at omega equal to zero. And these are all the complex poles, and complex poles occur in conjugate pairs. So if this is say S one, then this pole is going to be S one star. Okay, and if the pole the, I mean, I'm just, we will later see that as well. If a pole is in the right of S-plane, we say the system is stable. If it's in the left of S-plane, we say the system is unstable. If it's on the J omega axis, the system is said to be marginally stable. Now, we will talk about the frequency response and how do you get frequency response from the Laplace transform. So if you see the Laplace transform H of S, it depends upon two variables, one is sigma and also j omega. Okay, so on an S-plane, we have the sigma sigma and j omega plane, which is nothing but the S-plane. You can actually plot the magnitude and phase in a three-dimensional graph. So first, if you see here, H of S, it depends on two variables, sigma and two independent variables, sigma and omega. At the same time, H of S is also a complex number, so it has both magnitude and phase. So now, if what I've shown here is nothing but the magnitude response on an S-plane. Okay, it will be actually a three-dimensional plot. H of S, uh, if I want to plot mod of H of S as a function of S, it's going to be a three-dimensional plot. And if I cut it, if I slice this mod of H of S, this three-dimensional plot, along the S equal to J omega plane. So this is the, uh, this will be the S equal to J omega plane. So this will be the plane. If I slice it along that, if I cut it along that, I'm going to get the frequency response. Okay, so that's nothing but evaluating H of S at S equal to J omega. So frequency response, it's a very important parameter. I mean, it's a very important characteristic of a system. Now, it tells you what is the response of a system to different frequencies. So let's say we know the frequency response H of J omega. It's a complex number again. Okay, H of J omega is a complex number. It has both real and imaginary parts. Now, if I feed a sinusoid of an amplitude Vp, then the output will also be a sinusoid. So that's what, uh, that's a property of an LTA system. Uh, for a linear time invariant system, the output frequency will always be equal to the input frequency. It's violated only in resonant systems uh, where there are poles on the J omega axis. In that case, you might get some additional frequency, only just a few additional harmonics of the resonant frequency as well. Okay, so typically the same, uh, depending on the poles on the J omega axis, you will get some, we will see that example a little later. Okay, but generally for a linear time invariant system, the frequency at the output will be same as the frequency at the input. So if I apply a sinusoid of frequency omega naught, at the output, I am going to get a sinusoid of frequency omega naught. The only difference will be in amplitude and phase. The amplitude is simply given by the input amplitude times the, the frequency response evaluated at omega naught. And the phase again is simply given by, I'm sorry, and the phase again is simply given by the phase of the transfer function or the frequency response evaluated at omega naught. Okay, so that's why if you know the frequency response, you know the behavior of a system for any sinusoid. 
Now, once you know the behavior of a system for any sinusoid, it's as good as knowing the behavior of a system for any signal. Because we know from basic Fourier transform theory, any signal can be represented as a linear combination of sine waves or sinusoids. Okay, the signal is aperiodic, it will be a continuous, a continuous sinusoids. Okay, if it is periodic, you will have infinitely large number of sinusoids but discrete in number. Okay, but the thing with frequency responses, it tells you everything you need to know about the system, the behavior of a system for different frequencies. Okay, and it's very useful because in real life, the signals that you are going to apply mostly either they are Fourier transformable or they are periodic. Uh, which means you can represent them using Fourier series. And for that, if it's an LTS system, frequency response is sufficient. But what frequency response very clearly does not tell you is about the idea of stability. So one such example is, let's say we take a transfer function, which has poles both in the left off and right off S-plane. So shown here, this is a left off S-plane pole system, and this is a system with a right off S-plane pole. The magnitude response, the frequency response is going to be same for both. Okay, so that's what I've shown in this graph. So this graph might look a bit intimidating, but it's just a three-dimensional graph of H of S, uh, H of S, and uh, I've just tried to show that. What I'm showing here is that for three poles, the first pole is at S equal to zero. So you can see, you can actually see the singularity in the frequency response itself. So it, it actually, this graph is a three-dimensional graph, so it will go like this in all directions. Okay, so it will be like some kind of an volcanic. Uh, you know, a mountain. So you'd have a peak at one point. It'll be it's just that it's going to go to infinity. Okay, it's a singularity there. If you slice it along the JMYG axis, if you let's say I plot it along uh, in a two-dimensional graph, it'll look like this. This is omega equal to zero. So this is mod of h of j omega. Okay. So this is nothing but the frequency response of an integrator. So we'll uh, talk about that later. Now, what I wanted to say here in this graph is that. What we are actually plotting is nothing but a slice of the transfer function, magnitude function H of S, okay, sliced along S equal to J omega axis, okay, this, this axis. So whether the pole is here, which is here, this is a left of S plane pole, or if the pole is here on the right of S plane, when you slice it along the J omega axis, you are going to get the same transfer function. It's going to look the same. The frequency response will look, magnitude response will look the same. Okay, so that's why it's not a very clear indicator for stability. So which is why we have to resort to Laplace transform and S-plane, look at the location of the poles and talk about the stability. And then to understand the frequency response, we can then after that we can come to frequency response by just evaluating it at S equal to J omega. So for what I, all I'm saying is that this function also looks like a stable transfer function, but it is not. Okay, so uh, a very yeah so uh, so that's all i wanted to ma uh, make a point here the knowledge of frequency response and the location of the poles both can be inferred from the knowledge of hfs so frequency response alone is not sufficient is, is what is all i was trying to say here and the other important i just uh, forgot to mention is that this analysis what we are doing right now it's for open loop transfer functions Okay, so if you want to analyze the stability of closed loop systems, uh, we can infer that from an open loop transfer function as well. So we will talk about that when we discuss feedback. So now we will uh, take some examples of poles on, on the S-plane and then see how the systems behave for a finite energy input. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to apply a very narrow pulse which approximates an impulse. Okay, so the only reason is I wanted to pick a pulse with a finite energy. Impulse has very high infinite energy, so it's it's which is why I picked a pulse with a finite energy. Okay, so that's fed to a system. If the energy and power, power will be zero. If energy is finite, power will be zero. So if you recall, the energy of a signal from basic signals and systems is simply given by this integral. In fact, it's calculated this this way: limit of some t naught tending to infinity. Uh, integral minus t naught by 2 to plus t naught by 2 mod of x of t the whole square dt. So you just have to take your signal x of t, integrate it in a limit from minus t naught by 2 to plus t naught by 2, square it and integrate it, and then you let the limit t naught to tend to infinity. 
okay if this integral converges then you call it as a finite energy signal if the integral doesn't converge but if you do something like this if you just find the average energy so which is limit of t not tending to infinity and 1 by t of this integral and then multiply this integral okay uh, with this integral okay if this converges then we call it as a power signal energy doesn't converge but power converges then we call it a power signal okay for a signal with a finite energy power will be zero so that's what i referred to this so if i feed a finite energy signal and it turns out the output energy is also finite and power is zero then it's a stable system okay and if the output energy is infinity it's it's increasing it's not converging but its power is finite then we call it as a marginally stable system now if both the energy and power diverges to infinity then that's an unstable system so this is what we call as a bounded input bounded output stability for a bounded input you should get a bounded output okay then it's a stable system if you are going to get an unbounded output it becomes an unstable system that's what when i say unbounded it's going output is going to diverge to infinity so your power will also blow up to infinity so that's what i've written in terms of energies and powers that's the only difference here so we'll take some very simple examples on sir from circuits since we are anyways analyzing circuits so the first example here uh, shown here is a simple system with a left off s plane left off plane pole it's a simple parallel rc circuit a parallel rc circuit i'm injecting a current and uh, let's assume that the area under this current so if you integrate current you get charge is q not so the instant you apply the current capacitor is going to behave like a short circuit it has a very low impedance at high frequencies so the entire current is going to fully charge the capacitor to voltage of q not by c after that the resistor is going to discharge it so the voltage is going to reduce because the resistor will discharge the capacitor it's a positive resistance so it will discharge it now if you look at the way in which it's going to discharge i mean the rate of change of the voltage at any given time is simply proportional to the voltage itself right the higher the voltage the more current the resistor is going to draw out right so if i have a capacitor the larger the voltage across it the more the current the resistor is going to pull out of it so the slope is going to be negative but it's proportional to the voltage so this is an interesting function if the derivative of a function is proportional to the function itself the only solution which will solve that is an exponential function so which is the solution will be of this form a decaying exponential because it's negative here okay so this system is a stable system i applied a finite energy input so which is a very narrow pulse and the output is a decaying exponential so area under this square and find the area it's going to be finite so this is a stable system so which means if i have a left of s plane pole no matter the location of this pole on the real axis it's always stable okay now similarly i have taken another example in this case we have a right of s plane pole see the transfer functions i i don't i really don't care about the exact values i just i just took an example here the location of the pole is actually 1 by rc uh, in the next lectures uh, probably in the upcoming lectures i'll we'll discuss how to find the poles intuitively okay so in this lecture we are just analyzing the effect of poles on the stability so here i have picked an example where there is a negative resistance here so a negative resistance is an active element it can supply energy to the system okay so now the instant you applied a charge or a current pulse to the system the current will entirely flow through the capacitor and it will develop a sudden step voltage because there is a sudden change in the current uh, charge so there will be a sudden change in the voltage as well so that will be a q not by c now if you see this resistor is now pumping current into the capacitor because the direction of flow of current will be into the capacitor because the resistance is negative now so which means capacitor's charge is getting added so you are increasing the energy of the capacitor and the rate at which the energy is increasing is actually if you see here it's proportional to the voltage at any point if you if the voltage across the capacitor is high then the resistor is going to inject more and more current so it's proportional to the voltage okay so the only difference is now here it's the slope is increasing so in that case the output is going to be a growing exponential so a growing exponential function it's a it's not an energy signal you can very easily show that its output is going to become unbounded eventually 
okay so any write off s plane pole if i have a write off plane pole the system is going to be unstable the, uh, in, in fact i can keep va varying the values of r and c and show that for any write off s plane write off plane pole on the real axis it's going to be unstable okay so mind you the magnitude response for both the circuits will look the same okay the phase will look different but uh, in time domain we can actually see the best way to see a stability of a system even for nonlinear systems is time domain okay but by looking at for an LTA system, by looking at the S plane, the location of the pole, the geography of the poles on an S plane, we can predict the stability itself directly. Now, this is what we call as a marginally stable system. So, I am suddenly feeding a charge Q to the system. So, a capacitor will instantly take this charge, it will develop a voltage of Q naught by C. But now, here there is neither loss nor any new energy being injected into the system. Okay, it's a lossless system. So the energy will, the capacitor will discharge the cap, uh, the inductor will discharge the capacitor, and the inductor will store. The, the thing is that when it's discharging, the energy is not lost; it's stored in the capacitor inductor. So the inductor's current will peak uh, when the capacitor voltage goes to zero. When the capacitor voltage goes to zero, the inductor current will peak here. Okay. So the energy will be stored, the total energy of the system will be constant. See, this is this energy is the energy across the capacitor, is what I'm talking about. Okay. So signal, uh, when you look at it from a signal point of view, the energy will increase a sinusoid. So for a, if you keep integrating it, the area on every cycle is constant. When you square and integrate it, the area on every cycle is going to be constant. Sorry, this is one time period. So which means as I keep increasing the area integration interval, the energy will keep increasing linearly. From a time domain signal uh, definition of the energy definition here is integral, let V be the voltage across it. So V square T dt. Okay. So if I increase this range of the integral, the value of the integral will also keep increasing linearly with T naught. So when I divide it by T naught, I'm going to get a constant power. Okay, so this is an oscillatory system. Uh, so the power is constant. So that's why it's a marginally stable system. So we will see why is it called marginally stable later, which means for some inputs, you the system can become unbound. It can give you unbounded outputs. So here, even though it's oscillating between two values, it's still bounded. You know, the output is still bounded. So which is why we are referring to this as a marginally stable system. We will see later, probably in the next lecture, for some inputs, this system can actually give you an infinite output. Okay, so again, uh, this can be. I haven't discussed that, but you can actually show the second order derivative of the voltage is proportional to the voltage itself. So that's how you get a sinusoidal solution for this. The third example here uh, this is actually a complex pole, but in the left off plane. So that will occur if I just add a resistor to an LC tank. So every cycle, your capacitor will store a charge instantly when you give a pulse, all the voltage will go through the capacitor. Then now, resistor is trying to discharge it, but inductor is also trying to discharge it. So whatever current goes through the inductor is not lost. It's now stored energy. But whatever that goes through the resistor is lost. Okay, so the energy is going to go back and forth between inductor and capacitor, but the overall energy keeps reducing exponentially. Because again, the resistor is going to draw out a current proportional to the voltage across the tank at any given time. So the envelope or the the way in which it, it is going to be a sinusoid, but it's a decaying sinusoid. Because every cycle, the energy in the tank is being removed by the resistor. Okay, Eventually, the output will go to zero. So this again is a finite energy output. So this is also a stable system. So if I have a pole in the left off plane, whether it's a complex pole or a real pole, it's always stable. The system is stable because it will obey the bounded input, bounded output stability criterion. If the input is bounded, output is also bounded. Now, in case of a write off S plane pole, and that can be realized by adding a negative resistance to a parallel LC circuit. Okay, you can quickly derive the transfer functions. In fact, uh, I've missed there is a factor S here, but I really, at this point, I'm, I'm just interested only in the poles right now. Okay. So, if I feed a, a sudden charge impulse or a, or a sudden current impulse, a very narrow pulse of current to this, the capacitor is going to take all that current instantaneously. And then the resistor is now injecting extra energy into the LC tank. Every cycle it is injecting. And that energy at, it is injecting is proportional to the voltage across it. 
across the tank so it's see when you have an inductor and capacitor they both are going to interchange the energy between the two but there is also a negative resistance constantly trying to inject extra energy into the system and that extra energy that is being injected is proportional to the instantaneous voltage across the tank so therefore it's going to the energy the uh, the amplitude is going to increase exponentially so, okay so this is uh, again the exponential increase is because of the rate of change of the voltage being proportional to the charge injected and all that the voltage being proportional to the voltage itself okay here i'm talking only about the peaks okay so this is a system with an unbounded output so it's going to increase exponentially so output is unbounded so it's an unstable system so whether you have a real pole or a complex pole in the j omega axis in the s right of s plane the system will be unstable so these are i mean I, I, these are well known points i'm just uh, explaining it for the sake of continuity okay so these are the three conclusions we have rhp poles unstable left lhp poles it's a stable system and if i have the poles along the j omega axis it's marginally stable or an oscillatory system okay the next lecture i'll often discuss some doubts sometimes the students have is can there be certain inputs that can make the system go ballistic meaning can it give you a large gain for certain inputs so that's what we'll be discussing in the next lecture